Lamination ladies and bunt boys. Grease your tins thoroughly. Prick your tender crusts before filling. And sadly, this is the soggiest bottom I have ever seen. It didn't rise. It's time to talk tall to me. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Count of Sealand, Owen Thomas Said. And I'm just regular old Nick McGill. Together we are the Feckless Moans. And this, my Easy Bake Babies, is Talk Tall to Me. A scraggly settling in the proving drawer of prog rock in which Nougat Nick and Opera Cake Omen will slice, sample, and salivate over every single track that Rolling Boil rock band Jethro Tull have ever popped into the oven of their creativity. We will poke the gooey center of the Dave Peg Petit Gâteau, dip our fingers into Don Perry's devil food, Masticate the middle foy of Martin Barr, and butter John Bundrick's bouche de Noel. And if we can punch down our yeasty nerves, masticate the marachinos of doubt, and avoid curdling our curiosities, we may tempt the tender taste buds of the spitakak of Scotland, the tart tartin of the tambourine, the lyrical lamington, the twinkie with the flute for a binky, the little ceramic baby Jesus in our king cake, a true crumb of the coolins, Ian aerated Amandine Anderson. He killed me at binky. You like I you know I he you like me. the silly rhymes. I've been putting in more of the silly rhymes just for you, Nick. It's because they're, they, up until this point, they were so infrequent. So it always catches me off guard. Yeah. You know, it's usually it's highbrow, 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 poop joke or Twinkie or something else. And it's, and the, the, the rhyming scheme just really nails it. It's just, just very unexpected. And that's what mm. gets me. Speaking of unexpected, Nick, what yes. are we going to be doing in this week's episode of Talk Tall to Me? We are talking, uh, we're, we're still dipping our toes into Nightcap here. We are on to disc two already, and we are on track three, piece of cake. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. As you said last week, this was one of the ones from later in the series. A lot of this album, or these two discs off of this album, are from the early to mid-70s. This is one of the tracks that was actually recorded in 1990 at Ian Anderson's home studio. Correct. And as I alluded to regarding the personnel, we of course have Ian Anderson, we have Martin Barr on the electric guitar, David Pegg on the bass, Don Perry on drums and percussion, and John Bundrick on piano and Hammond organ. That is John Douglas Rabbit Bundrick. Whom we just heard in Catfish, I believe. We sure did. Yeah. So we are definitely contemporary in terms of dropping this in chronologically on the grander scale. So we, this will be a big sound change from what we heard last week with Left Right, for sure. Prepare yourself. Brace yourself. But a small sound change from what we heard two weeks ago. No, it would be three weeks ago because remember before that we had, what was it called? Oh, the Thin Ice. We That's had the right. Thin Ice. So That's yeah. right. Good point. Good point. So, sorry to... Sorry to belittle you in front of the audience. <laughs> why don't you, why don't you just piss on my birthday cake, Nick? No, please, please, please piss on please my birthday do. cake. People pay a lot for that. Oh, they do. Mm. Mm. So you've never heard this before. Much of, probably all of what we're discussing f f through Nightcap will be brand new for you. But this is another new listen. You said you hadn't even looked at the lyrics until five minutes before we started recording. So correct. So very exciting. Yep. With that being said, let's have a taste. Take your insulin and dive in. Is that how it works? I don't even know. Uh, yep, sure does. <laughs> I'm not a diabetes doctor. I'm not a diabetes. <laughs> Nick McGill, that was a piece of cake. 
Oh man, how does that stack up to what you were expecting going into this song with that tiny little discussion of like, oh, we're going back into the 90s? I was not expecting this. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting. I, you know, as I was reading through the lyrics, I was trying to, I was doing two things at once. I was, I was trying to imagine how I would sing it just based off how mm. it's written. But then I was also imagining, well, how would Ian sing it? Because his scansion is often so unusual. Mm -hmm. And then listening to the song, it was much closer to what my original, like how I would sing it, looking at the lyrics. Yeah. It's a pretty straightforward scansion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty straight delivery. Yeah. It's almost a little bit pop rocky, like in, in the way that Jethro Tull could ever be pop rock but it's like it's very conventional rock and roll in some ways yeah but at the same time it also feels like an amalgam of four or five other Jethro Tull songs where it's like oh this riff reminds me of this mm -hmm. this little turnaround here could be from this other song and it it fits perfectly in the 90s in that sound era oh yeah yeah it's great Martin's guitar sound seems to be reaching forward to the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm, okay. Whereas the drum work being provided by Mr. Don Perry seems mm. to be a little bit retro, almost kind of that early oh, 80s. Oh, interesting. Sound. Yeah. Just on impression. Yeah, I get that. The guitar is very clean. It's very, very clean guitar. Not like we talked last week not like hermetically sealed clean but it's it's very crisp do you know what it reminds me of no no i don't <laughs> thank you for considering that question thoroughly <laughs> thank, thank god <laughs> dot com she bends like okay. a willow oh okay in piece of cake martin is going bdp and holding that third note In Ben's Like a Willow, he's going BDP, BDP, BDT. It almost is similar to that riff. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I didn't put those two together, but but I do hear it definitely. Yeah. Now, Nick McGill. Mm -hmm. Omen Said, yes. Omen Thomas Said. Count Omen Thomas Said, yes. Thank you. You uh, had Nightcap years and years ago. No, no, oh. I didn't. I didn't. It's just, uh, I've just exposed myself to it on Spotify. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, how have you found this song as you've been listening to it, because you've just, you know, you've listened to it a lot more than I have. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did go through a big stint of listening to it probably the last month or so, kind of ramping up and getting prepared for this album. It does stick out in feeling very 90s. Okay. It's fun. I don't quite get it. Lyrically, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to getting into the lyrics with you about this. Yeah. Because I feel like there should be something more, but maybe there's not. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll get into it. But musically, it's very, very fun. There's nothing too in-depth. The guitar is great. We got keys. We got flute. Drum kicks in. We got tambo splashed in here. Nothing complex, nothing complicated. But it is a driving 4-4. I think it's 4-4, if, I'm, if oh, I yes. counted correctly. You're right. So it's just, I, I think it's, I think you're having called it pop rock. I think that's that's a good assessment in terms of what Jethro Tull presents as pop rock. Yeah, and maybe pop is too strong. Maybe it's more accurate to say it is main. It is a little bit. It ha it's it's rock. It has a mainstream vibe to the way that it is expressed, the way that it's composed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's still distinctly tall. One of the things that I really love about it is on that chorus. I could be on your shelf. We have Martin doing these, a quick succession of rising chords. Bow, bow, bow. Be on your shelf, come the risk you take. And there's something that is so fresh about it. Mm. Because it does sound like it could be 
you know, a radio rock band, a more standard kind of 90s rock band, but it's a little different. It's got something new and, and fun and unexpected to it. Yeah. At 1.30, we have a really great flute and guitar breakdown where Martin is playing a lot of those long notes and Ian mm -hmm. is kind of weaving his way in and out. Come on. That's a pretty long breakdown and Martin's through it the whole time. I was expecting it to go like, oh, now we get a keys part. And the keyboard comes up a little bit in one of the pieces but the guitar is so strong through the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. At 153, we have an unexpected, I don't know if it's a modulation or some kind of a, a weird turnaround with the chords, but it, it suddenly, just when you think you've got the song nailed down, it, it, it acts a little bit like a greased weasel. Da, 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 da. Wow! And it just it renews the fervor. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's the second proving of the dough. I think that's the part where the, the keyboard does kick in a little heavier and really, really reinforces the, the idea, the theme of what's going on through this solo, quote unquote solo breakdown. Absolutely. I, I had it about two minutes, five seconds that the Hammond organ. <laughs> John Bundrick Rabbit really starts hammering on the Hammond, and it does have that beautiful old school mm -hmm. organy sound to it. It's yeah. really fun. There's something I don't. I was going to say I don't know if I would like it with any other band, but I do, I think it's I think it's kind of a staple in some of those really good classic rock songs that just it tickles me every time. I don't care who it is when it's in there. It's like it's it's just. It just adds something to it. It really does. It's almost like a stock character, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the theater, it's it's like you you hear the organ and you're like, oh, this guy. I it's know. the archetype, yeah. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> That's good. Ian is singing it pretty straight, pretty kind of like rock and roll mm -hmm. in very good voice. Yeah, great voice. We get a little goat voice in here. Get a little tiny, a kid just a kid here of a voice a baby goat on particularly on the word bowl as in you can bowl me over, you can bowl me over. i think i heard it earlier too mm. it's not a staple of this song but it does get thrown in there occasionally it's nice it's accent as opposed to the actual structure of the singing i just want to listen to the outro one Brief more time. Okay. Rather than a fade out, we have an outro, which is what I would expect to hear at a live concert. Yes. Very live feeling where you signal to the audience. Hey, this is ending. Yep. A really fun button. Yeah. Give the lighting designer something to do the, the Broadway bump to. Mm. If you listen to Broadway tracks ever, you know, like Broadway cast recordings, there is almost always a musical bump at the end. Hmm. And it is, it is called the Broadway bump, and it is paralleled by the lights because it gives the audience a physiological reaction to kind of shock them out of that song so that they applaud. Oh, wow. That's interesting. It's really kind of a fun little thing. Is that like a contemporary thing? Is that more kind of historical musicals, or, or is it does it span? I associate it from kind of like Andrew Lloyd Webber onward. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you would hear it in stuff like in the golden age with the music man and, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. It's probably when they started having a bit more control over the lights. Oh, sure. That's yeah. That's a really good point. Really thinking to take use to, to take advantage of that and use what you've got. A Broadway bump is also what you use to refer to the cocaine that the leading man does before going out for the big end of act one number. I thought it was the pregnancy that occurs backstage during <laughs> the run of that show. 
Oh, did you see Susan? She's got the Broadway bump. Also a Broadway bump. Yeah. Ooh, there's so many things that that could refer to. So many. Let's move on. <laughs> Anything else to say musically about this song? I, I, it, I have something to say. Please do. I can't believe I've never heard this song before. I can't believe that this is not a more popular song. This is freaking fantastic. I mean, Nightcap's been around for so long. And half of Nightcap was on other albums to begin with. It's so strange that, that these... Don't you even have the vinyl of Nightcap? Am I wrong about that? You... I don't think I have it. Oh, I thought you did. And you're right. It does seem strange that some of these that are more independent and not tied to like the Chateau disaster, you know, just like cutting room floor pieces that they haven't been tacked onto things. And there's so many of them. Yeah. It's just like any of the others though, you know, like, I mean, think, I think back to that slew of bonus tracks that came with broadsword, broadsword, the slew of bonus tracks that came with war child or with heavy horses, you know, they're all so gosh darn good. But they just, they're not out there until Tull puts them out there. And then, like, there's a little hubbub excitement. And then that's it. But, I mean, this came out in, what did we say, 92, 93, you know? So, Talk Tull to Me was not around in 93, Omen. That's all I'm trying to say. We weren't? You and I were alive. We didn't even know each other back then. There was no such thing as a podcast. Mm Mm-mm. That's true. iPods weren't even a thing. They weren't. Internet was barely a thing in 93. That's true. Kids. (laughs) Kids. <laughs> I think that this just points to how prolific Tull has been as a band and how prolific Ian is as a writer. Yeah, absolutely. It's just crazy. He has so much to give, Omen, that much of it gets closeted away in a, in a reel somewhere. After making love to a woman, he says, I wrote a song while we were doing that. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> he jumps out the window. <laughs> Nick, welcome to the second half of the podcast. Here we are. We had nothing for the middle, so we'll dive right into the recipe that is this piece of cake. The middle is just buttercream. I mean, there's not much to talk about. Just enjoy it. Have you ever made a buttercream? Oh, I sure have. Is, do, you, do you find it difficult to do a buttercream? Uh, no. I find it difficult to not make a buttercream. To not eat the buttercream. <laughs> I only ever made it once and it broke. It's literally just butter and sugar. I know. I think it got too hot. I think it got too hot. Uh, yes, common mistake is to do it in the oven. Yeah. No, room temperature butter. That was very early into my cooking career, though, so. Yeah. Nick, piece of cake. Piece of cake. This is a common phrase in English, and it means what? If something is a piece of cake, it is easy. It's simple to do. It's easy as pie. Easy as pie? Yeah, that's probably more than the American version. What is the British version? Piece of cake. (laughs) (laughs) No, same meaning, different accent. Yeah, Right. Okay, got it. (laughs) It, There's a version in Italian, which I think they do. They do sometimes say easy, like making a cake. Facile come come fare una torta. But they also say facile come bere un bicchiere d'acqua. Easy, like drinking a glass of water. I get it. No. It's too long, though. It's too long in Italian. In Italian, it's the right length. That's what they say in Italy. Everything (laughs) is the right length in Italy. Yeah. Fair enough. Piece of cake. So we have the the mindset of something that's easy. Yes. Come running. Go for overkill. If you don't come now, I'll be over the hill. Come running. Okay, interesting. A couple of idiomatic phrases already. Mm -hmm. Overkill. Something that is more than is necessary, more than needed. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And then over the hill. Over the hill is, I have it as either a way, like you've gone over the hill, so you're you're no longer visible, but also like 40. Isn't 40 over the hill, quote unquote, middle-aged? Yeah, over the ho- over the hill is always to me implied just old, whatever old means. Oh, old, okay. Uh, and it's it's also a very kind of older generation way of saying, maybe it is specifically forty. I think it was like when we were kids, it was forty. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 60 is the new 40, though, so. 40 is the new 20. <gasps> no wonder I feel 20. What? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Tell me all right. So basically, if you don't come for me now, if you don't come and taste these cakes, they'll be stale? Right, yeah. And and we get into it in this, this next line. Gotta sell by date, soon be out of stock. Pop me in your trolley, you can start my clock. Well, all right. Tell me all right. Gotta sell my date, soon be out of stock. Pop me in your trolley, you can start my clock. Well, all right. Tell me all right. So that really solidifies the over-the-hill expiration date thing. Because... I'm only good for so long, basically. <laughs> you know, I can't help but think about this in a in a sexual or romantic context. I definitely get not even necessarily romantic, but like flirtatious yes. and like start of a relationship feeling. It's not even necessarily sexual to me. There's there's a little innuendo here, but it's not like really slathered on. I think it works both ways. I think it works anywhere on the spectrum of flirtatious to expressly sexual. Sure. I think what's amusing about it is this sense of there's a practicality, which is very typical for Ian, and a self-deprecation, which is very typical for Ian, saying, yeah, I'm a hot piece. I'm sweet. But not for long. <laughs> but yeah, don't wait too long or I'll go off. <laughs> it's very funny. It is. It is. Just for reference, Ian was 43 in 90 when he wrote this song. Or when it was recorded. I mean, I don't know when he wrote it. But. If we're using that classical definition of over the hill, he was just over the hill. Just hit it, yeah. Just went over, just crested. As Shakespeare said in the song in Twelfth Night, O Mistress Mine, In delay there lies no plenty, then come and kiss me, sweet and twenty. Youth's a stuff will not endure. But don't you want to endure youth? No, youth itself will not endure. Yeah, you can't. You, yeah. It, it is, it's It's got an expiration date. It does. You got to drop it like it's hot. Hot cakes. I could be on your shelf. Could be the risk you take. I'm a cup of hot coffee. I'm a piece of cake. Piece of cake. Hey, on your shelf. So cake goes stale, you know, a piece of cake even more so goes stale because it's cut from the hole. It's, it's exposed, you know, and a cup of coffee goes cold. Now, this could mean that it's not so much to do with his age, but the freshness of his affection. Mm, okay. Hey, whatever spark this is that we have, whatever desire you have for that cake in the store, you better act on it now. Right. Follow your impulse. Take the risk. Because you may not want that cake later on. And the cake may not be wantable. Yes. Your desire may fade and the thing for which you have desire may change. Yeah. I could be on your shelf. There's also the implication of like, you better buy me before Sweet Tooth Sally buys me. Yeah, I, I could be yours. I could be somebody else's, but it could be yours. I could be yours. I'm fr it's a free market economy. <laughs> you could buy me up. No inflation, baby, until you want there to be. It's either you or Diabetti. <laughs> That's actually the name of a drag queen. Oh, okay. No, no none of my material is original. God. No, I guess not. Jesus. None of these parts are original either. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I'm the hot chicken in your superstore. You can take me home if you can take some more. I'm the hot chicken in your superstore. You can take me home if you can take some more. I like the, the hot chicken in the superstore because it's he says soup in just the way that it's like hot chicken in your soup. Or store. Or superstore. Yeah. Also, very interesting that the concept of a mega market. What do we call them? A supermarket? A supermarket. Mega Mart. A Mega Mart Superstore. Yeah. Super Mart. Mega Store. Walmart. Walmart. 
anyway, the concept of a very large kind of industrial size grocery store that had every bell and whistle that you could possibly imagine was kind of new, especially in England in the early 90s. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. You know, they were still transitioning. I think we we did it earlier. Probably, yeah. They still had the tradition of you go to the green grocer, you go to the butcher, you go to the creamery, you go to the bakery. Yeah, right. You go to the patisserie. You make a day of it. You go to the oyster shack. Yep. Specifically for your oysters. You go to the pig foot pavilion. And the idea of a hot chicken, you know, like these machines that you can cook a piece of chicken and then keep it hot all day. So it's Mm. always hot and ready for you. That's such an American capitalist idea. Yeah. The trays full of rotisserie chickens that were baked rotisseried hours ago. Or the fried chicken wings. Oh, yeah. The breaded chicken wings that I always love smelling and sometimes eating when I go to the superstore. Chicken fingers? Chicken fingers. Or actual wings. Both. Your chicken finger boy? I'll finger a chicken. Bacock. Buc- <laughs> <laughs> That's not my cloaca. <laughs> you can take me home if you can take some more. I almost have the, the impression that like the shopper's basket is full and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, but I but I need that one other thing. I'll just, I can manage it. I can stuff it in there. Right. I'm, I'm clearly not a necessity. You know, you've got your bread, you've got your eggs, you've got your milk. Every You filled your basket. You do not need fried Ian Anderson. But if you've got a little more room, right. there's a little, little Ian for you, for the taking. You can take me home and you can take some more. I could be on your shelf, could be the bread you bake. I can fill your larder. I'm a piece of cake. I could be on your shelf. Love that phrase fill your larder we call mm-hmm. it a pantry yeah but the idea of oh the larder's getting a bit bare not i need groceries but the larder needs to be filled it's so antiquated but also the idea of the pantry and the larder is that's that's the stuff that you buy once and it lasts you a month it's where you put your flour it's where you put your your dried grains and pasta it's the stuff that you go back to over and over and over yes Although I think the further you go back in time and the the less of an obsessive relationship that cultures had with refrigeration, right. the more you would have what we would consider go offies, go the offies, uh, perishables. Yeah. You would keep things that we would consider more perishable in the fridge. I remember visiting Spain and opening a cabinet and just seeing a plate of sausages. <laughs> I was just like, oh. Oh, you keep, oh. Cooked, I hope? Yeah. But still, the sort of thing that as an American, I was like, those should be in the (laughs) fridge. OSHA would shit a brick. In France, they don't keep eggs in the fridge. Oh, yeah. I mean, we don't need to keep eggs in the fridge. No, it's a scam. Yeah. Big. Big egg. Egg. Big fridge? Big. Big Freon. Who's benefiting out of us keeping eggs in the fridge? Who came first? The egg scam or the fridge scam? We'll never know. No, we won't. <laughs> uh, my favorite line coming up, show me Rosemary, I'll show her wild time. Oh my God. So good. Show me Rosemary, I'll show her wild time. It's a Gordian knot of puns. Love it. Rosemary and thyme, of course, are herbs, and it's spelled T-H-Y-M-E. Mm-hmm wild time as in i'll show her a wild time but also and we'll all go together to pull wild mountain time will you go lassie go yeah kind of a reference to that old scottish song i'm not not sure it's necessarily supposed to be maybe ian couldn't help himself no it's it's in his blood and rosemary is capitalized as a proper noun so he's clearly talking about Show me Rosemary. Yeah. yeah. See you at the checkout or on the credit line. See you at the checkout or on the credit line. I imagine this is a reference to back in the day when you stores may offer you a line of credit mm. independent of the advent of credit cards. Right. So you either have cash or you go through a separate line where they take down what you bought. And those are the options. Yeah. Right. Or theft. Or st- steal. Right. Yeah. Right. 
I'm your spicy filling. I'm your low-fat spread. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm your spicy filling. I'm your low-fat spread. <laughs> it could not be more 90s. <laughs> because of the low-fat spread? Because of the low-fat spread. Yeah. That was the beginning of the butter as villain. Yeah, I can't believe it's not butter. Country crock. Yeah. Who the fuck gave me butter? Margarine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they only showed that at late night commercials, ah. but it was it was a hit. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you accuse me of eating butter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fats the fats became definite villains in in the nineties for sure. And then in the early two thousands, it kind of shifted back. I actually yeah. remember a distinct moment when my my stepmother got so mad about you know some kind of margarine olive oil spread, and she was like. It's got so many preservatives and things in it. If I'm going to die of something, I want it to be butter. I mean, given the choice, butter's hey, pretty tasty. If a food stuff has to take me out, let it be butter. Let it be butter. A, a bullet sh shaped it out of butter. And then a bullet. Frozen. <laughs> I've got a butter with your name on it. Butter sniper. <laughs> <laughs> and then this next line, I'm baffled why it's in here uh-huh i'll be your smooth rubber be your pencil lead well it rhymes it rhymes the lead in your pencil is definitely a euphemism she puts the lead in your pencil you know okay okay yeah but why is it in, it nested in the middle of all these food euphemisms well also smooth rubber rubber is a british term for a prophylactic a condom that's true but i was thinking it was the it was the eraser on the other end of the pencil well uh, yes of course yeah. but i think that it's a it's a double entendre yeah but it's here in this food song for some reason oh could it be that a pencil is what you use to make your shopping list? That's a stretch. I mean, that's that's literally the only thing I could think of. It's it's the shopping list. It's the tally in the credit line where they, they write down what you've got. You know, something along those lines. That's all I can think of to make it work. And it, I mean, it it does, but it is a stretch. It is a bit odd. Yeah. He's already used bread as a rhyme. Yeah. I like my meat red. That would have worked really well, yeah. Yeah, he didn't use bread as a rhyme, but he did use bread, so. Why don't you toss my salad? Could be the pie that you bake and then use bread further down. Yeah. You know what? Maybe it just flowed out of him. Like pencil lead. Like pencil lead flows out of people. <laughs> you know some very strange people. If you set me to simmer, if you grill my steak... You can bowl me over. I'm a piece of cake. Piece of cake. Velvet Mondegreen. Okay. I always heard you can fold me over. I'm a piece of cake. Interesting. You fold stuff in while you're baking. You, you do? know. So you do? That, that's that's how I, I justified that. Sure. Whether in 1990 Ian knew the term to fold something into baked goods, I, I don't know. Bowl me over is interesting because there's the implication of a bowl that you right. might use for food, but also mm -hmm. to bowl somebody over is to knock. You could bowl. You could bowl me over with a feather. Right. Yeah. Bowling ball. Bowling ball. Yeah. Yep. If you grill my steak, that has a you know the there's a meaty, sensual, corpulent, fleshy, carnal. Yeah. Fleshy implication. Right. Yeah. If you set me to simmer, have you ever used this phrase? In referring to a flirtation or a relationship of like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna let that simmer. Like, oh yeah, I'm 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 gonna let her simmer. I've been with my wife for you don't even remember eighteen years now. Okay. I think yeah, so probably not. But I mean, I I've also heard it as just like I'm gonna think about that. I'll let it simmer. You know, you just sure. let it you let it percolate. But it does have a there's this heat connotation of something kind of constantly being at a low steady heat yeah that can gradually cook something i'm going to give somebody just enough attention to keep them inflamed and desiring my my cakes my steak that needs to be grilled i remember a, a good friend of mine in france a french guy 
had a lot of flirtations. And he was always like, he was always being strategic, you know, trying to figure out what was the move. And I remember he said, and I don't, you know, he, I, he said at one point, he, he compared a flirtation to a beef bourguignon, which is a beef stew that you have to cook at a very low heat. Uh-huh. And so he, ba- he said basically in French, yes, I'm going to put this beef bourguignon on the small flame on the back of the stove. <laughs> Meaning like, I'm going to let this flirtation continue until the right moment to yeah. dine. <laughs> I just, yeah. It's slightly psychotic. Well, it's, it's French. <laughs> it's French. Fair enough. It's French. And that's it. Then we're at the end of the song. So, so there's no, there's no arc here. There's no, it's all just like I'm advertising myself through food metaphor. Get in on this. I can't believe we've not said this. Maybe it's so obvious, but I'm a piece of cake is a way of saying I'm easy. Oh my God. Right? Yeah. It was there in front of us the whole time. Yep. There it is. I'm easy. That's funny. Yeah. I'm putting more work into coming up with all of these metaphors than you have to to get into my pants. I'm doing all the work for you. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's funny. I'm literally like an I'm an easy bake recipe. You just pop me in. Right. Yeah. Buy that that Duncan Hines uh, brownie mix and and that's it. Just throw in a couple of eggs and we're golden. Wow. Did you ever have an easy bake? No, I had creepy crawlers, which were the the boy version of of easy bake. They weren't edible, but they were like it was like this liquid plastic that you'd put in an oven and then you'd you'd pull it out and they would just be like little gummy worms and spiders and things. Those were not edible? No. Do you not still have the ones that I gave you? I have to call my pediatrician. 30 years ago. They don't make them anymore because the the things- Because they're toxic. No, the things that they went in were solid metal. So when you pulled it out, kids would just be like, yay, and then burn their fingertips off. Yeah, the 90s were a different time. They were. They were. I think Ray had an easy bake, which was, li- they. I mean, they were literally just a light bulb. Yeah. You'd turn the thing that would lock- the, the tray in the oven and that would also activate the light and then you just let it sit. That reminds me, how many other tall songs that are gastronomical are there? I feel like there have to be some, right? The content of Night in the Wilderness is pretty gastronomical. I don't remember that at all. Am I the stab with your crab? Who's got oh, the yeah. lobster on my blobster? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> lobster on my blobster will go down in infamy. <laughs> what else? I don't know. I'm perusing. I mean, John Barleycorn, kind of. Yeah. I was thinking of that or a cup of wonder, but those are more drinky oriented. Yeah. Im, Im, imbibitory. Yep. There are some that are fumatory in nature. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, Paradise Steakhouse, of course. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, like a tall thing girl has the curry reference. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It seems surprising that there are not more for some reason. Well, you know, often I think there's a, a tendency in Ian's writing to focus on more the ethereal, more the these ineffable moments. And there's something very, very literal and down to earth about food. Yeah, even though all of this is metaphor, it does anchor you in, well, everybody can experience a steak, cake, yeah. bread, blobster. Steak, Blobster. <laughs> Would you like some lemon with your blobster? <laughs> Blollandaise sauce. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next week, you, as you know... As you know, next week we are talking Silver River Turning, which is track five off of Nightcap, disc number two. That is, let's see, that is also recorded in 90. 
from the same time in the Ian Anderson home studio. Great. Three, five, eight, and 14 were all there. That's right. Until next week, if you can take some more, why don't you take some more of our branded Talk Talk to Me merch? You could be sipping your comestibles out of a branded Talk Talk to Me mug, and they really are quite cool. A nice size. The mug sized. It's perfect. <laughs> If your larder is running low, you can stock up on additional podcasts yes. by subscribing to our Patreon. Very simply, you will get two extra podcasts a month, plus the entire back catalog, which is several years worth now at this point. And you get access to our Discord, so everyone else will help fill your larder as well in that Discord. Until next week, my sell-by date is well past. I'm Nick McGill. I wish my spread was low fat. I'm Omen Thomas Sade. You can pop us in your trolley. You can start our clock. We are the feckless momes. And get it while it's hot. Soon we'll be over the hill. This is Talk Tell to Me. Daniel Cockermouth is baking today a lamington with a center of fresh sin. When not baking in the tent, he lives in Bushy Gap with Mother, Demon, and his 73 cats. He tests out his bakes on unsuspecting orphans who have no choice but to eat them. Today, he'll be using cyanide from his own garden. Youngest person in the tent, Nigel Bushwick, has brought his very own baking dish today in which he's b- baking a trainer. He has filled it with shoe pastry and his own whipped cream flavored with lavender. When he's not baking, he is spending his free time at Satin Upon Gravy, where he loves to read books about clotted cream and fish. Meg Pastor Prime has been dead for 30 years, but that doesn't stop her from trying out her bakes in home Beef Lane in Oxfordshire. When she takes the train to Dick's Mount, she always gets freshly spotted dicks from the dickberry bushes that grow wild. Today, she'll be baking a Friar's Entry baked in an actual friar's entry. (laughs) For legal purposes, we are unable to show this bake. And the last surviving member of the tent this week is Veronica Veronicae, and she is baking her favorite dish that she used to bake for her gran. She's baking a rice pudding on a field of lettuce. (laughs) When she's not baking, Veronica loves to stand outside of Buckingham Palace and scream for the Queen. She loves in particular to scream about her favorite podcast, Talk Tall to Me. And she likes to say that it's a proud member of the Feckless Momes Audio Network. Until next time, from Shitlington, this is the Feckless Momes Baking Extravaganza. (laughs) 